Welcome to the Jeffco DeAngelis Foundation podcast series focusing on school safety and security. My name is Kevin Carroll, Executive Director for the Foundation. Throughout this series, we will be engaging in informative conversations with local, national, and even internationally recognized experts in the arena of school safety. We will be exploring best practices in crisis preparation, response, and recovery, as well as gleaning lessons learned from these remarkable professionals. In special editions like today's with Deputy Chief A.J. DeAndrea, we will also be having conversations with people who personally experience school and community shootings. The Jeffco DeAngelis Foundation originated in Jefferson County, Colorado with a deep passion for and relentless commitment to sharing best practices in school safety and security with first responders, as well as school and school district personnel. We, in partnership with Jefferson County Public Schools, support a -a one-of-a-kind training facility, the Frank DeAngelis Center for Community Safety. This former elementary school is now a premier training facility that has supported training for over 7,200 first responders. Our trainings encompass everything from the practical to the tactical, focusing on proven approaches to preparedness, response, and recovery. More can be learned about the training facility, our team of nationally recognized trainers, and the foundation by visiting www.deangeliscenter.org. And with that, it's my true pleasure to welcome our special guest today, Deputy Chief A.J. DeAndrea. A.J. currently serves the Arvada Police Department, and as you will soon hear, brings a broad range of experiences and expertise to the table. Welcome, A.J. Honored to be here. Thanks. Also joining us today is Mr. John McDonald, Executive Director of School Safety for Jefferson County Public Schools. Welcome, John. Thanks, Kevin. Looking forward to the conversation. So, AJ, we're going to jump in by having you begin talking about your career path that led to your current position. Boy, that's uh, that's, that's quite a story, right? I guess it really isn't, though. It's just uh, basic law enforcement. I started in Arvada in 1993. Arvada was my hometown. It's where I grew up. Um, it's an a incredible place, right, to live, to raise your family. When I started there, it was the 12th safest city in the United States of America, mm-hmm. uh, a place where you would say nothing, you know, bad is going to happen. In 1996, I was one of the original members of the Jefferson County Regional SWAT team. Mm-hmm. Uh, that team is comprised of Jeffco Sheriff's Officers, Arvada PD Officers, and Golden Officers, as well as Edgewater. Uh, Edgewater came on much later. And it was the experience on SWAT that led me to um, some of the things we're going to talk about today. Mm. 1999, I found myself responding to Columbine High School. At the time, I was a breacher and ended up once the cafeteria was cleared um, and given the, uh, the daunting task and the honor to lead a small team through the center part of the school on the first sweep, again, looking for the gunman and looking for uh, any victims. After that event, September 26th, uh, September 27th, excuse me, 2006, led to my second school shooting, uh, Platte Canyon High School. By that time, I was um, had moved up in the ranks on SWAT and ended up being third into the room on the hostage rescue to try and save Emily and another little girl. Uh, we were successful in rescuing one, and Emily was shot and killed at a distance of about three feet from me as we were attempting to rescue her. Suspect was shot and killed by other members on the team. Mm. A few months after that, in a raging gunfight, rescuing a deputy that was pinned down by gunfire down in Willow Springs. And almost a year to the date after that, my third school shooting, December 9th, 2007, at Youth with a Mission Missionary School, where, as you know, a gunman went into the missionary school a little bit before midnight, ended up shooting four people, I personally carried out Tiffany, Tiffany Johnson. She was shot 11 times. She was alive when I put her in the ambulance, went back into the building, got to Philip Krause. He'd been shot one time in the liver. He was alive, carried him out and put him in the ambulance. Uh, Much later, I found out that they, uh, both of them 
died on the operating table, but we gave them the best chance to live. And so those three events and a lot of other things that really we won't talk about, and I, I guess the fourth event, the, the rescue of the deputy as well, changed the way that I viewed law enforcement, uh, how law enforcement evolved, um, was able to play a critical role in the older tactics to the newer tactics, and have really dedicated uh, my career to sharing the tragedies, the failures, and the successes of those calls to uh, help law enforcement change throughout the, truly throughout the world. Mm -hmm. That's quite a path. Uh, I know a unique part of that, and we'll get into it a little bit more as we talk about the different uh, events more specifically, but uh, Jefferson County is unique in that we have so many different agencies, uh, so many different cities within the county that have to work together. So having a highly trained and experienced expert like yourself makes a difference to the, the value that others place on that. I know there were multiple, multiple agencies that responded over to Columbine, and there were lessons learned about how to coordinate more effectively than kind of the methodologies we were using at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, and they're still changing to this day. So in your current role, uh, what are some of the responsibilities that, that fall within your care as deputy chief? So I am the deputy chief over what we call our sector division. So the Arvada Police Department is an agency. Um, it's kind of unique the way that we operate. Uh, we are 188 sworn, about 230 employees. And it's rare for an agency our size to actually have four standalone police departments, mm -hmm. right? Fully functional um, police departments, uh, buildings. And you see that in the bigger cities, you know, Denver, naturally, as big as they are. Um, but for an agency our size, it's kind of unique. And so my responsibilities is primarily the sectors and what goes on in the sectors. So that is, is our patrol operations, uh, school resource officers, traffic. Um, anything that you can think of that would be in that realm would be uh, under my chain of command. Okay. AJ, talk to us about how law enforcement has changed um, during your career. And, and we were talking earlier, what does the future look like, uh, especially today in 2020 in, in the midst of all this chaos? So I think there's things that have changed profoundly, and I think those are the tactics. Uh, and I can get into that here in a little bit. I think the things that maybe haven't changed is the compassion um, that the officers have, the, uh, the dignity that they carry themselves, the resolve, the true commitment to serve this community. You know, we're in a tumultuous time right now. And you know, we were talking earlier about the number of arrests that take place in this country uh, daily, there is just the odds against us that something's going to go wrong doing that. But the vast majority of officers from when I got on the job to where we're at now, um, I think the compassion is still there, the desire to serve, the understanding of what our role is. Things have changed as, and again, I think more along the tactics and maybe the methodology of how we do stuff to where we have to be more reactive. We have to be um, quicker to respond, more nimble in our actions. And I can use Columbine as an example. You know, Columbine, the deputies that responded there did exactly what they were trained to do. The problem that day is we, we weren't forward thinking. We, we were kind of set in our ways. And so you've seen this great evolution since then. And so they got there, they set their perimeter and they waited for SWAT. And that was pretty much a standard across the country. Um, an episode like that was something that they wanted a, a TAC team, SWAT team to address. And we learned quite quickly that that was the wrong mm. plan. And so really the epicenter of active shooting took place in Jefferson County. Uh, I remember being a part of some of those conversations. Uh, Larry Glick, the uh, executive director of the National Tactical Officers Association came to Jefferson County uh, Mike Odell and some, some other officers from LAPD SWAT came. And there was a lot of information shared. And shortly after that, the active shooter training began where we started to train patrol officers not to wait, to give them the skill set, 
to be able to go into these events, not have to wait for SWAT and to address it. Now, at the end of the day, it's always better to have a SWAT team dealing with tactical stuff because that is their wheelhouse. But we learned we can't. And so when we talk about priorities and, and life safety priorities, officers have to risk when there's the potential for serious bodily injury or mm -hmm. death. So people are dying while you're people waiting. Are, right. So we can't wait, right? So you see that start at Columbine. The results of that we can see across the country and truly across the world. At Platte Canyon, uh, a lone deputy went into that building when he knew he was going to a confrontation with a, a man with a gun and got to the door and contained the suspect. And in my, you know, my personal feelings is he's an absolute hero. By getting out of the car, going inside, not waiting, he saved lives. Hmm. And I believe that to my core. Single officer response really wasn't even talked about you know, in, in 2006. And so what we learned at YWAM is we continue to evolve, you know, like us, hate us. We're, we're very introspective. We try to change to do things better all the time. You'll see change from the, what's going on in, in the, the society right now, but we try to change and get better. And so at YWAM, you know, in 2007, it was impossible to get fire and EMS into an active shooter scene unless we could say that it was secure, mm -hmm. we knew where the gunman was, the gunman was contained, all of that. And building up to YWAM, at least at our agency, we knew that that could create problems for us. So we did training with uh, our local ambulance service, and they trusted us. And on that night, we had no idea where the gunman was, but we were able to get... Uh, EMS into an unsecure scene. Again, uh, we carried the, uh, the victims out to them, giving the victims the best chance to survive. And that would be the beginning of what we now call rescue task force, right? The, uh, the combination, the combining of police and fire uh, elements mm -hmm. to be able to get inside mm -hmm. and save lives. So you've seen what I would say is a realization of our failures and true commitment to fix those and get better all in an attempt to save people's lives. What do you think might be some of the barriers that get in the way of certain agencies um, implementing some of those lessons learned? We, we watch some reports of school shootings around the country and, and see and hear things that, uh, make us cringe and go, wow, we, I thought we learned that lesson. Right. What happened? Well, the thing that we do know, right, is history repeats itself and we need to learn from history. Unfortunately, I think there are still some communities that have that feeling that it's not going to happen here. Mm -hmm. And I can say without a doubt, that's how we felt in Jefferson County on the morning of April 20th, 1999. School shootings have been going on for a, a long time. Columbine wasn't the first one. We know that for sure. Uh, but there's that feeling of it can't happen here. And unless we can get over that hurdle, and that takes a, a certain approach to maybe knock down some of those barriers without coming across, you know, too hard mm -hmm. and like we're overreactive. Um, it's, it's a realization that truly what is our job? What is our profession? Mm -hmm. You know, law enforcement is tasked with, with multiple of things that they have to do. But primarily, we are here to save lives. We put body armor on and a gun every day to go out with the main intention of saving lives. And if we can express that to the community, get buy-in from the community, because it's a community effort. Mm -hmm. It can't just be law enforcement Absolutely. doing it, right? If we can get buy-in from the fire services, if we can get buy-in from the school districts, at least for us all to own our part, hmm. to come to the table and, and own our part and work together. What it looks like in Jefferson County might be totally different than what it looks like in Timbuktu, wherever. Mm -hmm. But those 
conversations have to take place and it has to make sense. And we have an obligation to learn from history. And we know we can stop these, right? We, we've stopped quite a few in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? So, so some other things have changed since um, Columbine. But Columbine, while it wasn't the first, it, it was one of the first that was nationally televised. And so in this age of um, instant social media and those kinds of things, it, it makes me wonder how often our uh, law enforcement partners might be uh, looking over their shoulder when you're talking about acting and reacting, right? And wondering, right? Instead of being able to focus on the issue or the event to have that hanging over you and going, I wonder, or is somebody going to make this look into something that it may not be? Or I, all these things that I wish were not part of clouding the, the scenario. How's that impacted your guys? Over so, time? you know, we're aware of that everywhere we go we're on video, whether it's somebody's ring doorbell, whether it's somebody's phone, whether it's somebody's surveillance camera, a business camera. And so you, uh, it, your it's cameras on your team. You've too, got, right? yeah. Um, right now at our yeah. PD, we don't, we don't wear uh, body worn cameras and we have very explicit reasons for that. But yeah, I mean, you're always on video and you try to, I, I'll be honest with you. I think it was harder for the older officers to adjust that didn't mm -hmm. grow up mm -hmm in an age of social media. The younger officers, they are, I mean, it's their life. They're on, you know, Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter and probably other platforms I don't even know. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I, I think it's easier for them to adjust. We do have conversations though about, you know, be careful. Everything that we're doing is being recorded one way or the other, whether it's through a law enforcement platform or whether it's through someone else's social media. And, you know, we have to be professional no matter what we're doing. Um, you know, that's a daunting task uh, to know that everything you do during your workday is, is recorded. And yet again, I think that the younger officers understand that and they, they're able to work through that probably easier. I think that speaks to tactics and training too, right? Sure. Yeah, uh, you have the right tactics and the right training and you're implementing it effectively. Then, then uh, the opportunity to be recorded just reaffirms. Absolutely, that you're doing the right work, I've doing the right said things. That. I've always said that, right? I've never been afraid. You want to put a camera on me? You want to film me? Everything I'm doing, I have no issues with that because I'm not concerned about the actions that we're going to mm -hmm. do. And if the tactics are solid, and the thought process and the methodology, the, the operational philosophy is solid, then we trust in what we do. I mean, there's still ugly things happen. Taking someone in under arrest that doesn't want to be arrested is never a pretty thing. So ugly things do happen, but you can explain them and uh, have a conversation about it. As you share your experiences with others around the country, and you do a lot of training all over the world, what are some of the common misconceptions and myths that you keep hearing? So some of the frustrating ones, and, and for those that know me know I get a little fiery at times, have to do with Columbine. Um, there are so many misnomers about Columbine, about the response, about what took place that day, about what the actual deputies and officers and, and SWAT officers and fire and EMS personnel were doing. Um, and... I understand where some of that comes from. You know, we were sued multi multiple times. I was on a five-year federal gag order um, from one of the lawsuits. And so we weren't allowed to speak. We weren't allowed to talk about what happened that day. And so Urban Lore and these, these people that weren't there started talking about Columbine. And, you know, I'll go do a Columbine lecture and you'll have people come up. Some of them have tears in their eyes. Some of the guys are like, I, I, I am so upset because I've been training and talking about Columbine wrong for years, right? And so that's probably the, that's probably the biggest one. And, and when I speak and when I do my debriefs and some of the training, I typically don't ever have an agenda other than trying to make people better. But when I speak about Columbine, I, uh, there is a little bit of an agenda there to get the facts right. The people that were there, the victims, the community, 
they deserve to have that story told correctly and not to be made into something that helps somebody sell some piece of equipment for a school or to, uh, you know, for a multitude of reasons, right? And so that's, that's probably, those are probably the biggest ones. I've seen you challenge uh, the so-called experts publicly mm-hmm. um, and, and be pretty direct um, when they get it wrong. How, how important is that for all of us to do when those myths and misconceptions are out there? So if we build, again, I talked about the importance of, of an operational philosophy and methodology and tactics. If those are built off of truths, we're doing the right thing, right? We're asking our officers, we're asking our school personnel to do amazing things that they never talked about before. Before Columbine, we didn't do lockdown drills. We didn't talk about active shooter. We didn't do those drills. We know that when we do those drills, it prepares us and we're better for the event. But we're asking them to do things that, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we never even talked about. They deserve to have a solid foundation of truth and facts underneath them so they can do what they're doing with fidelity, right? When we have, you know, people out there misrepresenting the truth and building their tactics off of that, it comes into question, Mm. right? It comes into question. And I think just as a human being, to tell, to make sure that the facts are out there for everyone that was involved, I think is critical. It just needs to be what it is. Nothing more, nothing less, just what it is. So um, you've been a part of multiple events, and when these events occur, everybody comes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just increases the need to have well-coordinated efforts across agencies. Talk a little bit, you've talked a, a little bit about how you and the EMTs worked on some responses together, but what advice would you have for a community that um, has been operating kind of in silos, separate from one another, uh, not intentionally, but just, and everybody caring, but just doing their own thing. Uh, what advice would you have for them as they start to look at how do we coordinate well together? So as tactics has evolved, right, from perimeter base to four-man active shooter to single officer response to rescue task force, our incident command has changed as well because you're, you're right. If we're going to be successful, you have to have a unified command. Everyone that has a say in what it, I mean, everyone has to have a say, right? If they have something that's in jeopardy, they should be at that table and have an equal voice. And everybody has different intel. Everyone right? has different intel. And, you know, the cops own the crime. The fire department owns the fire. EMS, the victims. The school, the kids. Mm-hmm. Everybody has a different piece there. But they have the same voice. And to work coordinated, unified, you're going to be much more successful. When we see failure points... Um, it's not always on the tactical end. It's on how was this thing managed? How was unified command? Was it command? Was there incident command? What was the communication piece? You know, if we don't have good intel, we can't make good decisions. And so there needs to be a clearinghouse. Intel comes into one spot. Conversations are had. That information is shared out. That can be difficult to break down barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, traditionally, you know, police departments and fire departments didn't get along. I will tell you this, the Arvada Police Department has probably one of the greatest relationships with Arvada Fire Protection District. And we're very proud of that. Those silos were broken down and we work hand in hand. Um, We're very proud of that relationship. The relationship with Jeffco Schools. Mm -hmm. um, Again, uh, just to be able to sit down and some of the conversations that have to be had but trusting the person that's showing up because you understand what their intentions are. Mm-hmm. And so unified command is, is huge. And again, those were lessons learned. When Columbine started, there were you know, individual incident commands, and it took some time to finally get those 
morphed mm-hmm. into a unified command for information sharing. And uh, so one again, of those lessons is do that ahead of time. That needs Don't to be done ahead of time, right? Wait for the scene to happen to then start to say, well, what should we do? Part of that, I would imagine, has to do with um, everybody checking a little bit of their ego at the door uh, and then owning your own stuff, but then collectively saying, we have something bigger that we need to be committed to together. And what are we willing to do to make that happen? Absolutely, right? All of this is um, has to take place before. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's some heavy lifting that has to be done. You're known for being, well, I'd say passionate, direct, driven, dr- direct. Dr- sometimes direct. <laughs> you think uh, it's a good thing? You know, you know, when you're not working with the Irvana PD, you're also uh, working as a instructor for the National Tactical Officers Association. You train law enforcement and school districts all over the country. Where does the drive come from to keep doing it at this level for all these years? That's a very personal question, Um, but it goes back to the loss of Emily. And so we lost Emily uh, September 27, 2006. And shortly after that, again, we lost her at Platte Canyon High School, if people aren't familiar with with the call. Shortly after that, we found out that the Keys family wanted to speak to us. And I thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, there were a lot of barriers that had to be broken down. A lot of people that didn't want you. A lot of people, calls, right? a lot of people that didn't want me. Uh, people on the SWAT team that didn't want me to go. It took a little convincing to uh, Sheriff Ted Mink. Um, some, some great conversations with him. Again, a, a dear friend of mine. I think the world of him had the utmost respect. And I think through his vision, he, uh, he saw that some good could come from that. And so he allowed me uh, to set up an arrangement to speak to the family. Again, there were people on the SWAT team that didn't want me to go. And I was explaining this to the TAC team and asked if anybody wanted to go with me. And uh, Mike Danuzzi, a, uh, in my mind, a, a true American hero, an incredible man, uh, raised his hand and said, I was a sergeant at the time. So, Sergeant, I want to go with you. And so uh, I called John Michael Keyes on the phone that night. We had about a two-hour conversation. And to be honest with you, I can't really remember what we talked about. We didn't talk about the incident. I think we were just feeling each other out. It's interesting to get his perspective from it. Uh, You know, he's a big man and he's a proud man. Um, much later he told me, you know, he found himself kind of in a, sitting on the floor in his kitchen. He never sits on the floor and talks on the phone, right? But it was decided, um, October 17th, 21 days after her death, that we would go to the family home and have a conversation. And so... I put on my Class A uniform, all the medals, all the regalia for respect. Mike Danuzzi showed up in his. We did the long drive up to the town of Bailey. I stopped. I bought a peace lily because I didn't want to show up empty-handed. And walked into their family home. No attorneys, no brass, no PIOs, just two men representing a SWAT team that lost a little girl and a mother and father that were still mourning the death of their, really the murder of their daughter. Sat down at their dining room table and I told them that um, I wasn't going to tell them what happened. They would have to ask me because I wasn't sure what they were willing to hear, what they were ready to hear. I told them I'd come back a hundred times, but be careful what they asked because, you know, whatever they asked, I was going to be blunt and I was going to tell them what took place. And so after a three-hour conversation uh, with a lot of tears, it was time for us to leave. And at that moment, I stood up and I looked Mr. Keyes in the eyes and I began to shake his hand. And in that moment, I made him a promise 
that the loss of his daughter's life would not be in vain, that I would go anywhere, anytime, speak to anyone to help them do it better. And that is why I do what I do, it is to fill a promise made October 17th, 2006, to the Keys family. So, AJ, in fulfilling that promise, you do several presentations around the country, around the world on mindsets. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could share with us just a few of the top priorities and strategies that you share with attendees of these mindset presentations. So, everything that we do tactically, right, there is a, a thought process, there is a buy-in, and there are biomechanics that have to take place. So we start with the, uh, the mind, right, and having the right mindset. And one is just the understanding that we took an oath and we need to be prepared to go do this. But we give them an operational philosophy to think through to help people make quick, solid, sound decisions. The absence of a decision in a crisis is as bad it's, right. it's probably too, worse, it? right? <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes, you know, making a bad decision is better than making no decisions at all. So how can we get rid of the minutia? How can we concentrate on the things that are important moment in time to make decisions? And it is an acronym that we commonly call PI, which is Life Safety Priorities, Intelligence, and Environment. When we look at our life safety priorities at the top of the list, is anyone that's an imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death. Below that would be, and I, I, would, I don't even want to say below it, but the next option is civilians, then law enforcement officers, and then the suspect. And I'll break this out for you. Again, life safety priorities. If someone is an imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death, what that does is it allows the officer, the sergeant, the commander, whoever is making decisions, to be more aggressive in their actions. Because if we wait, like at Columbine, mm -hmm. if we wait, people could perish, people could die. So to put it in an easier perspective, you have a rollover accident up on the highway. The 911 calls come in. We understand if we don't get there quick, people are gonna die. That allows the officer to be much more aggressive, dynamic maybe, mm -hmm. it might be the better word, uh, to drive lights and sirens to get to the scene. That's not the norm. It's not the norm to drive lights and sirens. And it's actually very dangerous for the officers, right? More of us get killed in traffic accidents than, than anything else annually. Put it in the realm of active shooter. Probably the wiser thing to do is to wait for a SWAT team to get there. They're better equipped. Like it or not, they're better trained. They have better equipment. Um, they're working as an element that trains all the time with one another. But we can't. People are dying in the People meantime. are dying, right? So we've spent a ton of time and heavy lifting and training the patrol officers to get to work, right? Your school resource officer inside a school, the shooting starts. Rather than waiting for two or three other patrol officers to get there, Single officer response, let's get to work on viewing what's taking place. If we don't, people are going to die, right? So that's that imminent threat. The analogy I like to use, let's take away the imminent threat. Let's say we have a suspect that is barricaded in their home. No one's in the home with them, and they're firing rounds out of the house, right? The priority on that call isn't the guy inside the house shooting the gun off. There's no one inside, right? It's the civilians. The neighbors. The, the neighbors, the people that are you know driving by down the street, all that stuff. So it's a slower process. We're not going to go kick the door in and go get that as if it was an active shooting. It's a slower process. We set a perimeter. We contain. We start to evacuate mm -hmm. the residents that are close to this scene. We ask the individual to come out. If he complies, it's done. If they don't, we'll test compliance. If compliance still isn't met, then typically the TAC team's going to be called out. A SWAT team's going to come out. The SWAT team gets there, they're not going to go kick the door in, right? 
they're going to make sure that the patrol officers are secure. They're going to remove them from the scene. They're going to bring negotiators up. They're going to try to talk the person out. The person decides not to come out, then they're going to test compliance, whether that be through shooting gas into the structure, um, property damage, deconstruct the home, however far it has to go. But you can see there's a different, mm -hmm. right? Third on the list are the officers. And when we first started talking about that, you know, and even still to this day, sometimes I get kickback. I get officers saying, no, you know, officer safety is number one, no matter what, no matter what, I'm going home. And trust me, I subscribe to that, right? That's why we provide good training tactics and tools to our officers. Um, train them, you know, so that they understand they have the mental capacity as long as the biomechanics to be able to go do things. But truly, if their safety was the most important thing, if the officer's safety was the most important thing, when a 911 call came out and bullets were ripping down the street and buildings were blowing up, the officers would do what? They wouldn't go. They'd go home. <laughs> yep. They'd sit on the couch. They'd turn on the news and go, whoa, check this out. It's crazy, mm -hmm. right? That's not what they do. Sometimes they go to people who don't even like them. People we don't know. That 911 call comes out and they go to work. The most honorable profession on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And I hope I didn't offend anybody by saying that, but I will defend that to my dying day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in people the service that of hate others. Us, in the service, in of, the others, service right? of others. Um, so they go to protect those that cannot protect themselves with good training, tactics, and tools. We hope that who we're going to likes us. Doesn't matter though, right? No matter what, you call 911, mm -hmm. we're coming. We're coming. Fourth on the list is the suspect. Now, sometimes people get upset about that. Why is the suspect even on the list? Well, there's a thing called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We will not violate someone's civil rights. We will not uh, break the law, enforcing the law. The suspect have rights, and we will ensure that those rights are taken care of. Um, and so that's... The P, that's the priorities, and that's the order of life safety priorities. The I in Pi is intelligence. Tactics are intel-driven. It is the most fragile part of any tactical operation. Information comes from people. People get excited. We don't always know, you know, what they see, what they think they see, and what they say are sometimes different. Officers will laugh quite often. They get dispatched to a call. You know, the call, the caller, the reporting party, we call it the RP, the reporting party calls into dispatch. The call taker takes the information correctly, gives it to the dispatcher who airs it correctly. The officer goes, and by the time they get there and leave, it's something totally different. Completely different. Yeah. Right? Because there's all kinds of things that take place and misperceptions mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff, right? So intelligence is fragile. When we go back to the unified command, that's why it's important to have everybody in the room. We're vetting information mm -hmm. as it comes. But tactics are intel-driven. That's what's going to drive what takes place. And so communication. You know, I always tell the officers, you make your money doing three things. Make decisions, communicate, listen. That's how mm -hmm. we make our money. We make decisions, we communicate, listen. That communication piece is the one that gets critiqued probably the most in any major operation. Monday morning quarterback, Monday morning. right? Once all the information is out, right. uh, you have to operate based on the information you have. Right. And you may not have some of that information, right? Exactly. Uh, this is where that mindset work, I think, is so significant because if that officer gets the wrong information, uh, innocently, right? But then they're amped up because of what they believe they're going into. They need to for, right, for, right. to be ready, but then also need to be open enough and aware enough to respond to what actually is happening. Yeah, either it's what was said, it's worse or it's better. So uh, the great, a, a great example of that is Columbine High School. The first team that makes entry into Columbine on the east side were told that there were eight gunmen inside the mm -hmm. building barricading, taking hostages, unknown location. Again, another true American hero, Sergeant Jamie Smith, Denver Metro SWAT. He's, uh, he works at their range now. He, he's their range master. Uh, was the first man inside that building. Um, the utmost respect for him. And the intel that he had were eight gunmen inside the building barricading, taking hostages. By the time we get there and we make entry, we're told six. Hmm. Now, there was some people on the roof that it got cleared up, at least two. But again, well-intentioned. 
So now we think we've got six individuals inside, you know, shooting, mm-hmm. killing, taking hostages. 250,000 square foot building. No idea where they were. Um, and so that changes the tactics, right? It changes the way that we operate. So sharing of information is critical, right? And that's the I and pi. The E and pi is environment. The environment dictates the tactics, and that is where law enforcement has what I would say is some of the advantage because we can manipulate the environment. When we do things to manipulate the environment, to put ourselves in a position of advantage, to take options away from maybe our adversary, um, when we're smart in how we do that, we have a better chance of a successful outcome. And there's, there's, that's where a lot of the biomechanical training takes mm-hmm. place. You know, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, threshold assess? How do we move down a hallway? How do we, you know, manipulate the environment to keep ourselves, keep the, the officers safe? And so in a nutshell, that's pi. Now, it's, it's a much longer conversation sure, than we sure. had just here, right? But that is the mind. So that's part of the mindset. That's the decision-making matrix, if you will, to... Uh, allow people, officers, uh, we teach this to uh, our our school um, executives, people that are in a decision-making position in a crisis. How do we get rid of the minutia, concentrate on what's important, and that's the the, uh, Mm -hmm. matrix that we use. I've got a question that I've wanted to ask for a long, long time. And this is a perfect opportunity. Can can you share with us why anybody, a reasonable, sane person, would climb into a cave and take a picture of a bear? (laughs) And and would you do it again if 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 you had a chance or was once enough? Um, You know, I'll I'll tell you. um, That's the one of the times in my life where I knew I was alive (laughs) because my heart was beating so hard, I could feel it coming out my ears. and I actually went back the next year to do it, but the bear looked out of the den and I said, I'm done. So <laughs> once was enough. Yeah, once was enough. More brawn than brain for yep, sure that day. I, but I had a point to prove. I had a point to prove, right? I knew there was a bear in that cave. Nobody believed me. Nobody would go with me, and I climbed in there to prove it. <laughs> there's a picture. reason nobody would go with you. Yeah, right. There's a bear right? in the cave. Yeah, like I said, more, more, oh. uh, more brawn than brain. That's for sure. To, to close today, AJ, if, if you're willing um, – this work has obviously impacted you professionally, but um, it also has impacted you personally, not only through your commitment and dedication and work with Emily and uh, John Michael and the family, uh, but also for you. I understand that you got a call in the middle of the night uh, as a father, uh, not just as an officer. So if, if you're comfortable sharing that, I think our audience would benefit from, from hearing that. Sure. Um, As I said, uh, I made a promise that the loss of Emily would not be in vain. And so what we've been talking about here today is primary law enforcement tactics. Um, Back in probably 2013, we started teaching, I started teaching um, civilian survival tactics which evolved into the program that we have, which is called Evacuate, Evade, Defend. And I've instructed that all across the United States and in Europe as well. Um, And you get stories, you get people that call and say, you know, we're alive today because we're alive today because. And and there's there's some personal satisfaction with that, I guess. Um, But it goes a step further. And... It was November 8th, 2018. I was uh, lying in bed. It was a little bit after midnight. And my phone, I keep getting these texts. And I'm like, who in the heck is texting me, right? And I'm thinking if somebody's drunk texting me, is it going to be ugly? (laughs) It's going to be a problem. (laughs) And uh, I look, and it's my daughter. And the first text says, I love you guys. Now, 
I hope mm-hmm. everyone knows where those words came from. Those were the last words that Emily Keys texted to her parents before she was murdered. And for me and my family, those have always been a a, a code for us that something's mm-hmm. not right if a text came out with that, right? Um, you can imagine growing up in in my household, you know, my daughters were... We talked about things at the table. We mm-hmm. talked about what do we need to do to keep ourselves safe and to stay alive. And 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 so we had, you know, there's there's always verbiage there if something's going on so we, we know that there's issues. And it says, I love you guys. And she says, Dad, I'm in a bar in uh, Thousand Oaks. There's gunfire. I've made it to the attic. I'm barricaded. And I... Uh, if you can imagine, mm-hmm. my heart stopped. Mm. Uh, most helpless I've ever felt in my life. Um, and so I continued to text her to get information. I got on uh, Ventura County's frequency so I could listen to the dispatch mm-hmm. live. I called their dispatch center on my other phone. So my daughter is texting me. I'm sharing the information with Ventura County Dispatch, who in turn is, um, I can hear it being aired, and I could hear the tactics, and I was sharing that back with my daughter. Now, she was in the attic directly above where the gunman was when there was a lot of an exchange of of gunfire. Um, And of course, on my iPad over here, I'm booking a flight to Los Angeles. How do I get there? Right. The first flight out was at six in the morning. Um, And so, you know, just through communication with her, you know, I let her know that, that, you know, SWAT guys were on scene. I said, they're probably going to be dropping some flashbangs. She uh, she heard that. Um, And all of a sudden, my daughter texts me and she says, Dad, I can see SWAT. And naturally, right, I, I go to DIA, I get on the plane, I fly, I landed. She'd gotten to uh, her apartment maybe 15 minutes before I got there because they kept her there, they interviewed her, you know. And it was, it was strange to me because a buddy of mine in Montana texts me a guy that I trained um, quite a few times, and he, uh, he said, you know, AJ, your daughter's alive because of all the training that you've been doing across the country. Mm-hmm. And I still don't know if I agree with that, um, but I do know my daughter was alive because she was empowered, because we had the conversation. She was empowered to be able to make decisions, to not live her life scared, to be able to react and respond appropriately. And that's the real reason why she's alive. Um, But I'll tell you, I'm in debt to uh, Ventura County SWAT. So um, it's gone full circle for me. It has gone full circle for me. And that doesn't mean my road is, is done. I still have a fire and a desire to, to train and help people get better and to learn. I think the day that, that we think we know it all in this profession, we become dangerous. And so every training that I do, I I've always walk away with, with learning mm-hmm. something. Um, but full circle, from being there at Columbine, from starting developing these tactics, from pushing these tactics out across the country and, and again, you know, as John mentioned, the world really, um, and then to have my daughter saved by it. So, uh, it's been an interesting ride. Well, AJ, I want to say thank you again. And John, thank you for your time and for your daily commitment to keeping schools and communities safe. Uh, we certainly are lucky to have the opportunity to learn from you and your expertise and experience. Uh, This conversation has been brought to you by the Jeffco DeAngelis Foundation. More information about the foundation can be found at www.deangeliscenter.org.